gardening photojournalist and author Deborah Lee Baldwin. In this video, I'll show you nine different fledgling birds at my feeders. All are common throughout the western United States. Birds mate and nest in spring. Fledglings start showing up at feeders in late spring and summer. But because they look much the same as their parents, how do you tell a baby from an adult? Mainly by behavior. Many fledglings are less than a month old. They hatched from eggs a few weeks earlier and very recently left the nest. So it's no wonder they're a little clumsy. Fledglings will peck at the outside of a clear food container because they haven't learned that not everything that's visible is accessible. We'll see more of these scrub jays later. The world is entirely new to a fledgling. All this one had seen a day or so earlier was its nest, parents, and siblings. New fledglings may spend time just looking around. They're more accepting of other birds at feeders. Adult birds generally chase other species off or try to avoid them. But the biggest clues are the ways newly fledged birds still act like nestlings. They've yet to learn to feed themselves, so they follow their parents around, begging loudly. They open their mouths wide to create an easy target for food. This is called gaping. Tissue inside and around their mouths may be colorful, fleshy, and even look like lips, especially at the corners. At the prospect of being fed, they become excited, cheap, and flutter. Sometimes it's merely a shiver. Sometimes a fledgling becomes a flapping blur with a vigorously bobbing tail. Parents may ignore a frantic offspring in the hope it'll notice that they're eating, that there's food available, and that it can feed itself. Some parents, like these house finches, are lenient and cave in easily. Others, like lesser goldfinches, are unflappable. Pun intended. The younger the fledgling, the more attentive its parents. The older, the more they tend to ignore it. Fledglings catch on fast, so their urgent begging is brief. Only a day or two. Parents don't necessarily pick up food and stuff it into an offspring's mouth. They may regurgitate what they've already swallowed. To move the food up and out, they rapidly shrug their shoulders. Now that you know that fledglings are basically wide-eyed toddlers who cry when hungry and don't let their parents out of their sight, let's look at what's distinctive about various kinds. House finches or linnets are very common, but every time I notice a house finch fledgling, my heart melts. Tufts of baby feathers above the eyes make them easy to spot. Grab your camera. While making an earlier video on how long it takes wild birds to figure out a puzzle feeder, I worried about a fledgling house finch who arrived at the puzzle in hot pursuit of its father. I assumed there was no way the baby could figure out how to get to the food. Now watch. The baby either brilliantly figures it out or simply falls into the food. It's soon joined by a different adult. The fledgling continues to stuff itself while the other bird watches, as though wondering, how on earth did you do that? There's often no way to tell if a fledgling is male or female. Immature birds need to be drab in order to conceal themselves from predators, so they all look female. Males won't get their breeding plumage until the following year. Based on what you've learned so far, can you identify who's who at this feeder? Which are fledglings and which are mom and dad? Well, only mature male finches are red and parents feed their own offspring, so the one in the middle must be the father. On the left is a drab finch that isn't fluttering or begging, so it's probably mom. I'll soon show you other birds, but first, let's enjoy our house finch family. You're seeing them through my office window. I posted this on Instagram with the hashtag, this is why I don't get anything done. I'm an author and horticulturist specializing in succulent plants. Bird watching is a hobby 
that led me to try and show the beauty and personalities of backyard birds without using commercial feeders. You may notice that every so often, succulents photobomb the images. If a fledgling is past the begging stage and looks like a mature female, is there any way to tell the difference? Once again, behavior is a clue, as is the time of year, which brings us to Orioles. Orioles are attentive parents and will feed even those offspring that can feed themselves. Notice how Oriole fledglings hardly have to beg at all. You're seeing fledgling hooded Orioles with their mom at a grape jelly feeder I made from a thrift store candle holder. Orioles arrive in early March, nest in tall palm trees, and raise two broods before migrating back to Mexico mid-September. I wish I could recall when I shot this. If it were March, we're not seeing a newly fledged hooded Oriole with its father, but rather a courting couple. Orioles are among those birds that practice courtship feeding. A female will flirt, flutter, and beg. The male assures her he'll get dinner and she's not to lift a feather. He's also helping to strengthen her for egg production. Bullock's Orioles are less frequent visitors. I suspect, but don't know for certain, that these are females and or fledglings of both Oriole species. Bullock's females have whiter underbellies. The third bird is more yellow, its bill is longer, and its actions indicate it wants the Bullocks to leave. So I'm guessing it's a hooded Oriole, female, or juvenile. But Orioles have a love-hate relationship with members of their own family. They want to hang out with each other, yet they jab at them with sharply pointed bills. I imagine we've all known families like that. Now this is something you don't see every day. That streaky gray bird that's squeaking non-stop is not a house finch but rather a fledgling cowbird. Its persistent begging is directed at its foster parents, which in this case are Orioles. Adult breeding cowbird females lay eggs in the nests of other birds, which then raise them. It's called brood parasitism. Cowbird babies often hatch earlier than the host species, get fed first because they're loud and aggressive, and by the time they leave the nest, may be larger than their adoptive parents. On the left is the next bird on our list, the black-headed grosbeak. Adult male grosbeaks may be hard to tell from other calico-colored songbirds at first, like the Bullock's Oriole at right. Here's how I identify them, by that hefty, powerful beak. Grosbeaks show up at my feeders only occasionally, and they're fond of peanut butter suet and grape jelly. Once a grosbeak settles in, it lingers, munching slowly. They seem more reptilian to me than other birds. The drab one is either a female or a juvenile. I suspect the latter because it lacks the buff color typical of breeding females. On the other hand, it's not begging, so who knows? Scrub jays are intelligent birds that invariably look like they're up to something. Jays are not my favorite guests, but they're more pretty than they are pesky and are often entertaining. They're also bold. They'll look me right in the eye as they sneak up on expensive food I've put out for other birds. I tried to train them to keep away from peanuts by squirting them with water, and they enjoyed the game, which they won. Not surprisingly, Jays solved my puzzle feeder faster than all other birds who attempted it. One way to tell these are fledglings are the corners of their mouths. The one that looks scruffy may be younger than the others because it still has its baby fluff. Certain birds, like Jays, 
grow longer tail feathers after they fledge, otherwise they wouldn't fit into the nest. For comparison's sake, here's an adult jay. Compared to a juvenile, it's more blue all over, noticeably its head. Its bill is black and there's also black on its face. But perhaps the most recognizable difference between adult and fledgling scrub jays are those white eyebrows. Seeing an oak titmouse is always a delight. This one is taking the caterpillar to its nestlings, which like all baby birds, need protein. A titmouse's zeep zeep call sounds to me like scissors. It's a thrill when a parent titmouse brings its fledglings to the feeder. They don't normally group together like this. Titmice are cute due to eyes large in proportion to their bodies, short bills, and crests. They prefer peanuts, which I buy raw and unshelled. If a titmouse is out of food, it'll follow me around the garden, scissoring away, or perch and call outside my kitchen window. Also endearing is how they'll hold a peanut between their toes and peck at it. I began putting food out for crows after I noticed one dragging a wing and felt sorry for it. To explain why I was feeding crows to family and friends who don't find the birds charming, I came up with a plausible story. You see, when Francesca was a fledgling, she had a flight accident. After her family nursed her back to health, she became a nanny for the next generation. Notice how Francie soaks kibble and stale bread in water to soften it. Then, instead of eating it, she flies off with it. The idea that Francesca lives with her parents and helps raise their new nestlings is based on common practice with crow families. When nestlings fledge and accompany her and other family members to the feeder, Francie's younger siblings beg from her as they used to back in the nest. But when their parents are nearby, she hops back and lets them take over. Crow begging is loud and impossible to ignore, whether you're a crow or inside a house behind windows. Early on, Francie and her family learned that calling attracts a big, scary biped who shows her teeth at them. Evidently, boldly making eye contact is a huge threat to a wild crow. So they got stealthy. But the only way to quiet a fledgling is to stuff food down its throat. I love how the begging stops abruptly with a contented gurgle. Let's hear that again. Has Francesca ever thanked me? Yes, if she's the bird who deposited on my outdoor table a delicate little bone. California quail scurry out from underbrush and peck at fallen seeds and seem to like millet best. They're highly social, follow each other in scampers and bursts, and are incredibly adorable as babies. They're different from the songbirds that frequent my feeders in that they're precocial, meaning that like chicks and ducklings, they're able to zip along after their parents right after hatching. They grow fast, so seeing tiny quail is a true delight. I love how they pour down my garden steps. The window of opportunity to identify goldfinch fledglings is short. Parents ignore begging offspring, so fledglings catch on quick. Notice that in none of this footage does a parent actually feed its frantically begging baby. Goldfinches being thumb-sized are the smallest birds at my feeders. I've left them until last because they fledged later in summer to coincide with wild seed availability. I can see why people keep finches as pets. Once they get used to you, they'd rather eat than freak out. Lesser goldfinches are social birds that share feeders with house finches, sometimes as many as a dozen at a time. I give them raw sunflower seeds. I don't bother with fancy finch feeders or pricey perishable seed like Niger. These are lesser goldfinches. Females are yellow and gray with black and white wings. Mature males are yellow with black caps and mostly black wings. 
I hope you enjoyed this video and have gained fresh perspective on wild birds in your own backyard. Find more info in the video description, including what I feed them. Do watch my other videos on birds or succulents, hit the like button, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm author and garden photojournalist Deborah Lee Baldwin. Thank you for joining me.